We do tend to on this particular planet. Um, you know, we are on Earth, and it often happens that we stay with one person the entire lifetime, and, and that's great. Other times, we have all these experiences with different people for our growth opportunities, and they're both fine. We are so much more like dolphins than swans. I mean, I love us, like the humans here, the Earthlings on this planet. So work your work. Mm -hmm. Find a job in which that skill set is valued. Of course, it isn't just celebrities or politicians that have spouses who cheat. Studies show that at least half of married people have had affairs. What if your spouse or partner has been fooling around? Should you forgive him or her or give him the boot? And how do you move on with or without him or her? Dr. Melanie Urseg has the answers. And later in the show, Stephanie Vlahov, a headhunter, tells you how to work your quirk. If you're just a bit out of the ordinary in some way, this could actually be an asset in getting a job in this tight job market. But up first, Dr. Melanie Urseg, great to have you here today. Thank you. So that statistic is a little overwhelming. It's what, something like 50% of married women and 60% of married guys have had affairs? Yeah, and we do spend a lot of our time fielding this question. I mean, we've been doing TV, what, 40, 50 years now, and it's always about, you know, how can we get, and we usually talk about it, and then the man, even though, though the statistics indicate it's fairly equal, but we do feel that question a lot. So there's a tendency, though, people think it's the guys. They do tend to think it's the guys, but both genders have the propensity to find themselves in that situation. Will you talk about the, the desire or the urge to collect additional people to love? Is that how you phrase it? We do tend to on this particular planet. Um, you know, we are on Earth, and, and while we're here, we do tend to engage in the customary rituals. So marriage being one of those, we sometimes engage in that without really thinking about what it entails. Not that we're standing there prevaricating the vows, it's more that we as a people like to have a party, and um, which is fine. But um, I think that the main point to make in that is that there is no judgment when you move on from a relationship if you choose to do that. Okay, so you're saying if you choose to move on, do you mean as in having an affair or? No, I mean if you choose to move on from a relationship because it's so common that we come together, we merge and we part and divorce is so common nowadays. I think that all children are so used to it. It's not that they're the only child in the classroom going through that. All of their friends are going through the same thing. So I realize, you know, we're excited when we're at the altar and we do want to cherish this person. And it seems almost these days as though our vows are reflecting that. that it's not always until, you know, does this part as we've said in the past. People, it's like, maybe I'll put up with you for a while if you're okay, or, yeah, you know, that's... That, uh, you know, these marriages <laughs> are opportunities, they're growth opportunities. So everybody is growing at different rates, and it often happens that we stay with one person the entire lifetime, and, and that's great. Other times, we have all these experiences with different people for our growth opportunities. Um, meaning we leave the relationship, move on with someone else, move on with someone else, and so forth. And they're both fine. Well, now, in a married situation, though, are you saying that, because I've always felt, okay, you know, if you're, I, I do believe that people fall in love or else meet someone else that they perhaps like more, or, you know, or than the, the person they used to like. It's not really about liking more, though. It's hmm. a lot about somebody is holding the lessons for you, and you have already um, outgrown the lessons in your current relationship. So there's that irresistible draw, and that's what the draw is. It's not always just physical attraction. That is, you know, reflecting what's underneath, which is all these lessons to learn for soul growth, which is how everyone is coming together. But what were you saying? Well, my point was just though that, you know, if you're married and do fall in love with someone else and decide to leave your partner, shouldn't you get a divorce or yes. should you just have an affair and cheat? No, you should get a divorce. And I think one of the things that happens is that these people cheating, everything is reflective of within. You know, loyalty begins within. So when we're attracting somebody as a mate who's doing that, it, you know, it's sort of time to look inward and say, well, in what ways am I doing that to myself? How do I not honor agreements within myself? How do I not make time for myself? And then they're attracting somebody who's, you know, also not honoring agreements. 
So it's just a similarity of energy. And if we rose above that, if we decided, you know, I'm going to have better boundaries within myself, then we would probably find the person that we're with to look strange, like, why am I here? Then it would be much more easy to move on as we clear that issue. So what do you do if your spouse is cheating? If you have found that out, I would look within and say, how am I not honoring boundaries than myself to attract this person? So everybody has the right to make their own decision. If they say, I don't, you know, that does not reflect my consciousness at all, then you can say goodbye to the person. The thing that arises is that people have the fear of, you know, being alone, which is understandable in this right. planet and this separation experience, even though we're all one. Um, so that can cloud one's judgment. But, you know, it would be great, and I support everyone on really feeling and connecting more to love within so that there's not this desperation of circumstances where they have to hold on to someone that really is not reflecting their values. So, do you think it's possible to have a, a lifelong marriage to one person? Of course. And is it common or rare? Or? It's funny. I know. Is it common or rare? You know, we are so much more like dolphins than swans, and swans mate for life. Dolphins are very, you know, psychosexual in their behavioral dynamics, and, you know, they're just so much having fun, and, and we are so much like that, yet we have chosen within this society, like we said earlier, to engage in this custom, and does it really suit us? I mean, is the question, how about, you know, and it's already sort of happening, not everybody is getting married who's in love, and being in love doesn't necessitate a sheet of paper, so... So why, why do you think people do get married? What are well, some of the common reasons? I think it's the custom. People do that, you know, on the planet, and it's just a great reason to have this party, and it's the cake, you know how people are, and it's, it's like their one big day, you know. Um, <laughs> everybody likes a party, huh? Everybody likes a party, so we're going to... And, and maybe living up to expectations or the exactly. idea that, you know, you've got to get married because everybody gets married or right. and, and the sooner the better. And yeah, there is that. There's all that sense and people not wanting to be alone anymore and, and it's representing a life passage and all those things are great and you can do that and get married. And then as the relationship shifts, if it does shift, then you can, you know, both mutually agree that it's time to move on or if you're learning and really clicking and resonating at the same rate your whole life and that's great stay together but what if well let's say one person has decided to move on the other one hasn't what do you tell the person who maybe wants to keep the relationship but the other one well they want to keep the relationship more than the other person apparently is there just they got to learn to let go or what's the answer to we do that's a great way to say it we do have to learn to let go in the society and that is usually the way it manifests there's one person who wants to stay one person <clears throat> wants to go and usually um you know there's often that sense that the woman wants this fairy tale and the storybook and wants her friends to know that she's still in this marriage and it's really not like that anymore. There is no judgment in it and I think that people can feel more comfortable in saying, you know what, he's not for me and it is okay for me to move on and and I can still feel okay and, you know, feel love. It doesn't have to be contingent on a person. So there's really a lot of that willingness to let go, which is key, I think. And I think sometimes maybe the, the person though finds themselves, let's say, in in, in an unwilling victim or the fact that maybe they want to stay in the relationship the other person doesn't and so it's not so much letting, they're getting dumped I guess is what I'm saying and so is it a little more difficult than just saying you know you should let them go or? Well I mean I'm saying that because you're asking me um, of course it's difficult for people to let go but what I'm saying is that it's okay to let go and that Letting go means that you're in alignment with the flow of life of what's happening and according to your ideals, if something has happened that makes you, you know, want to move on from the relationship. So, so letting go, I think, um, it is key, you know, in, in a lot of facets of life. We'll be right back with Dr. Melanie Ersteg right after this. And we are back with Dr. Melanie Ersteg today talking about those cheating spouses. Well, you know, one thing that when you hear something in the news about a politician or a celebrity, you know, of course the Tiger Wood things comes to mind or 
any of the various politicians that have been caught in affairs over the years, there is always a sense of blame that, um, you know, if it's the guy or perhaps the woman, but especially the guy, that they're fooling around and that why aren't they staying loyal to that individual. But again, I always feel though too though that if, if the love is gone or if you're in love with someone else, that you know, there's no law that says you have to love any one person. There are six or seven billion people on the planet mm -hmm. and the idea that you know, you have to I mean it's a shame and it's you know, I think it's but to me it's between those two people and if it's not working out mm -hmm. then it's probably better that they do move on. But there's always this notion that you know that it, that it's that it's wrong that, that somebody's the bad guy if they now I, the problem I think is if they don't tell the spouse and that sort right. of thing and they're you know the other party doesn't know but but you know do you agree with that that it's it's not wrong to fall in love with somebody else to kind of circle around to what we were yeah I mean talking the about before. Bottom, bottom line here is really about agreements and boundaries so in that sense you know if you have developed feelings for somebody then you can be upfront and say uh, you know I think that some of my soul lessons lie here, or whatever way you want to phrase it. Um, I mean, if you're truly feeling that, then you know you can be upfront. But I guess in the case of what you're talking about with politicians and so forth, it's almost like that sense of, um, you know, of the way people may have operated in the past in terms of. Um, I mean, I don't want to speak for other people because I don't know what is driving them to do. It just varies so much in different circumstances. But um, it would be great if we can have this sense of, and everyone is on their own evolutionary path, even if I'm sitting here saying it's great. It's really about acceptance in the moment, and I'm like the voice of tolerance in that sense. But boundaries is key and how we honor agreements within. And what I mean by that is how we make time for ourselves, how we allow time for ourselves, how we run our lives and what's okay with us or not okay with us. And I think it's so common, the majority of us, to just run around so busy and not make time and then we attract this relationship and then we wonder why, you know, he is mirroring exactly what we're doing and it drives us crazy. Why? Mm -hmm. Because it's triggering that core issue is that we are not honoring our agreements or even intending on the agreements or, or forming them in the first place, you know, and so there really is that sense of honoring within that needs to happen first, then we can attract the like-minded other, you uh -huh. know, honorable. Well, sir, so are you saying, if I'm understanding you correctly, that when they say that he or she always dates the same kind of people or, you know, you always, in other words, if your spouse is cheating, you know, I mean, you always go for the guy who cheats or the woman who cheats or something and that you're not necessarily looking for somebody who's yeah, they're still working on that issue because they keep attracting it. Where does that issue come from? It comes from within and it's always malleable and changeable. We can always change our consciousness. So, <clears throat> um, If we want, I mean, does that make sense to where it comes? It can come from also, you know, in the childhood, but you don't want to blame there mm. either because it's still your consciousness. So. Well, usually, right, psychologists <laughs> like to blame the childhood or the parents or well, something, right? <laughs> blame is just observe the factors that influence. But, but again, you know, we have that changeable consciousness where we can today, you know, create, create new ideals within. So one of the most important factors is really finding that love, that connection of love within. I think it is so common for us to really feel like we love the romantic love because that's where love is. But I think it's really important to convey that it's not just in romantic love. You know, the point really is to come into relationships as whole people if we can. And um, when we're outside of a relationship with another person and just have that relationship within is to connect to love. And there are many ways to do that. And that might even sound foreign right now. What does that mean? Love is just romantic love. But, you know, people talk about meditation that, and it may be a, a tricky word for people to grasp, but it really mm -hmm. relates to not being onslaught with thoughts. And, you know, Oprah just did that oh. cell phone show recently. And it's so poignant because it represents that sense of um, we being the vehicle and then the phone representing the, all the thoughts and we sometimes tend to be just submerged in those thoughts and that is the crisis situation. I don't, I didn't that. see that particular episode so what, what, what was the cell phone show? Well, she was very upset. She wants people to be off Everybody was always using yeah. it. Yeah, because we are all doing that and I can understand we're talking but the sense of the the way that it had gotten so far in terms of people getting in accidents over it was really dire because 
um, it was reflecting that sense of how we just let thoughts overrun and make no time for ourselves. Then we want some person on the outside to really love us completely forever. And it's really our responsibility to do mm. that first by way of taking time, of making an agreement, they meditate, take 10 minutes to have no thought stillness. Stillness can be hard for us at first, you know, all the issues come up and it's, you know, difficult at first perhaps, but if we open up and then we open up our hearts and we feel that love flowing through. So you think a lot of people aren't whole or complete in themselves sure and that's have. what's preventing them from... Um, yeah, you find that everywhere. It's within, you know, let's say somebody stepping outside a relationship, going, buying shoes, taking drugs. I mean, these are all of the same, you know, factors emanating from this thing, issue of it being a little bit disconnected or flow within. Well, what about pets? You were telling me about pets earlier. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Do people transfer their love to pets because they can't find it with people or what? I'm really not the voice of good or bad. I think all is just is what it is and stems from consciousness so we can really have acceptance and tolerance with each other about that. Um, but yeah, you do find the humans going into the forest and you know plucking out the creatures and bringing them back because it's safe love and it's great to care for other creatures ourselves and each other so i mean i'm a fan everyone can do as they please well, i would say here in la people love their dogs their yeah. pets their, uh, there's a pet hospital in every yeah. corner a pet bakery right. a pet is there, do you have a pet um yeah dolphins i keep them in the sea though oh <laughs> okay well that's so no dog in the backyard though no not for me but um i do like horses Oh. But I mean, I love all animals, but, um, but you know, for most people, it's this safe way to love and, and it's someone who cannot leave us. And so we tie him up, you know, and it's just interesting the things that we do on Earth. I mean, I was at an aquarium um, in Hawaii, and, and it's just funny that that's not illegal, that we, and there's everyone swimming around. That's normal on our planet, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there is that sense, like you were saying before about letting go, that we really want to, you know, hold on to things. And I mean... I love us, like the humans here, the earthlings on this planet, because we all do want that love, you know, and, and I think that it would be great for people to know that it's, you know, you can receive it from each other, just open your heart, and it's safe, and for people to feel safe, they can both give love to, you know, the creatures in their house and themselves and each other, so. Well, during the break, you were telling me about the idea of all or nothing. Do you think a lot of people think it has to be all or nothing? I, I'm not sure what exactly context, I mean, I guess in relationships or love that you think that it's all, all Oh, or yeah. Well, we were discovering that about um, that sense of love that, that drives us all. We all want love. So we feel like it's only located, you know, in a marriage or only located in a relationship with our relationship partner. But love is all abound. And I mean, scientists call it energy. We all have our different name for it. But this feeling where we just feel really good and it's you know, we, we all know and resonate with that feeling of love. So, so I'm saying that it's not something that's only found in a relationship and it's really key to, to find that within so you're really stable and grounded and that sense of love so that you can make really sane decisions in relationships. Well, on that note, I wanted to ask you, since you mentioned Oprah earlier, I, you know, there was always, at least in my mind, kind of a stereotype or, of, if not Oprah, let's say talk shows where, you know, for a while we're like, the guy was cheating and, the, and had 13 affairs and the woman's sitting there and, and there he's, she's crying, he's crying, they hug each other and he says, oh honey, I didn't mean it, I'll, I'll never do it again. And of course, like two months later, he's out having another affair, but she mm -hmm. takes him back and says, oh honey, I'll never do it again. What do you think about that whole cycle of, you know, oh honey, and you know, so then the 14th time, you know, they all cry together and she takes him back and then he goes out and cheats again and then they all sit down and talk it out and cry and hug and then, I mean, do you keep taking them back if they keep going out and having affairs and cheating? And I mean, I can only speak for myself, you know, but, you know, other people do things based on their issues and, and that's... How many times is too many? <laughs> the first time or I second mean, time? in or? this case that you're talking about, what's happening is that, you know, they're not really solving the core issue mm -hmm. and there's some codependency going on where, and the guy's, you know, not feeling love really within and keeps stepping out for it. I mean, I don't know these people, I can't speak to exactly what's happening. Some and I'm people, talking in general, yeah. I guess, part. So, so yeah, and then if the woman is continually taking him back, you know, Probably there's some issues there too. <laughs> but the whole thing is that you can't really say that to people because people have to really make that decision, you know, based on their own consciousness and, you know, 
there's something happening with them where they are still getting some kind of needs met. And I know that to us on the outside it seems dysfunctional, but you know we are making decisions based on our consciousness, doing the best we can. So. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Melanie Urseg, on those cheating spouses. We'll be right back with Stephanie Vlahov. Vlahov. And we are back. Joining me now is Stephanie Vlahov, a headhunter, to tell you how to work your quirk. Great to have you here today, Stephanie. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So work your quirk. Mm -hmm. Your quirk is that element of your personality that people oftentimes comment on. Uh -huh. uh, you know, people routinely tell you, oh my gosh, you're so organized to the point of driving me crazy. Oh. Or I was going to say, well, until you added that part, I was going to say that sounds like a good thing being organized. Right. But, but if you're anal about yes. being organized. Yes. A quirk can often be perceived as a negative part of personality. Mm -hmm. Um, something sometimes that people are ashamed of. You know, that's the weird side of me. Now, you might think that that would be a hindrance in getting a job, but you say that actually there's a way to turn this around and turn that w weirdness yeah. <laughs> into something positive. Right, right. It's, it's basically about, uh, you know, seeing the glass half full instead of half empty. Mm. So in other words, if you're a highly organized individual, um, the type of person who likes to line their shoes up at night, you know, or put their pants on a certain way, sort of ritualistic. Um, like monk on the TV. Like show. monk, yeah, <laughs> yeah, but not to the point maybe of being diagnosed. You know, you could take that, that thirst for orderliness and minutia and put it into mining the web for email addresses of hiring authorities. There's a way that you can take that energy and put it in a very positive direction in terms of getting information. Now, did you mean as far as looking for a job or when you're actually on the job? Look, well, two, twofold. The first would be looking for a job. If you're highly detailed, going on the web, looking for email protocols of hiring authorities to be able to send your resume to and trying to really bypass HR. Sorry, HR people, but oftentimes the resumes sit in an inbox for a long time. And then once you're on the job, to find a job in which that skill set is valued. For example, an inventory control person, a person having to keep track of detailed medical records, that type Accounting. of... Accounting. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It sounds like an accountant. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, so you could use it in a twofold way. Well, I know over the years, what you've seen all kinds of, or yeah, you know, a lot of different examples of these. But there was somebody who used bedhead to their advantage. Yes, a gentleman who, um, a young guy who had a very tousled um, hairstyle that you know perhaps you know wasn't a fit in the financial services and insurance world that I recruit in. So it was kind of all. Yeah, all yeah, course. kind of you know all, all over. And he actually, um, I'd advised him, you know, why not look into a creative, more progressive industry because it's certainly not one that I work. And so, <laughs> you know, um, and he found a job with a public relations firm that represented a line of um, beauty products and one of them was a hair care line and they uh -huh. loved him because he had a certain look. And I wonder, yeah, he's probably the perfect model for their product right now. Did, did make us, did he, he wanted, they wanted his hair to yeah, stand up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They wanted yeah. someone who, you know, and also someone who has a very sort of rumpled, cotton, natural um, vibe about them, you know, um, is great for, you know, like a health food store because they don't want somebody coming in dripping with, you know, chemicals and, and a lot of, um, you know, different, too much jewelry or polyester. They want somebody in a very natural sort of state. And that type of individual would be effective perhaps in a health food store or organic. So, so better there than the bank. Better there than the bank or better there than the Nordstrom counter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah. And so what are some other examples? Of, of um, some other examples also are people who are, um, uh, this is what I'd written about in my first book, people that who are oftentimes labeled as having ADHD um, statistically have higher levels of creativity um, in terms of their thought process. They oftentimes think in a, in a funnel shape instead of a linear shape. So if you have that personality of the ability to multitask and lots of ideas swimming around your mind, you then have an intrinsic ability to look outside the box. 
So say for example you work in sales but nothing's happening for you there, then you know why not look into marketing or why not look into consumer advertising? Mm. People with that personality trait are able to look at things from a more holistic point of view and it's actually a benefit. Now, as a headhunter, as yeah. you mentioned, um, you, you do see some all different kinds of people, I imagine, come through the door. Yes. And But you even have advice as far as interviewing. Because yes. Because I imagine that, you know, that could, well, you know, does, could, could scare people, you know, if somebody comes in who's really out there or has right. some unusual trait. Right. So how can you turn that around and, and use it to your advantage instead of... You know, having them think, oh my God, where, where did this person come from? Right, right. <laughs> you have to really know yourself, and, and that, that sometimes can be brutal. Um, I tell people, if you're really unsure of your look and the, and the mesh that it would have, that the industry that you're looking at, you know, put yourself out of your skin for a minute and ask your friend. Um, ask somebody you trust. I had a woman recently who, uh, and again, I work in financial services and insurance, you know, not the most, you know, <laughs> sort of progressive industries. Um, and I, I interviewed a woman who was a brilliant claims professional, but she um, had piercings and tattoos. Uh, uh. And so um, I was very honest with her and I said, look, you know, you, you have a great look about you, but this is the industry that you're looking at. They're not going to understand you. Um, they're going to make a first impression about what you're all about, even though you're brilliant. So tone it down a little bit. And she did. She wound up not getting the job oh. because she, she was so, actually it was not her image, but she was so nervous that she oh. clammed up. Now, how do you tone it down with all those piercings or tattoos? Did she remove some? She did. Or, or she she did. had a facial one she removed oh. and she wore long sleeves um, and she did tone it down. The bottom line, though, is I don't think intrinsically she learned from this experience and, and I counseled her along those lines. I don't think this is the right industry for her because it wasn't her passion. Her passion really was music. So why did she just thought she could make a lot of money that way? Right, or, right, uh, so right. This is the music while being... exactly. Mm -hmm. So I count I had told her you know, you may want to look at slowly making a transition into your passion while still, you know, keeping a day job, so to speak. But it really wasn't where she wanted to be, we found out at the end of the day. And do you think sometimes that people's, well, I mean, you've told how you can use those quirks to their advantage, but right. does that sometimes, you know, maybe even unconsciously point them, point them in the direction yes. that they should be going? Yes. You know, even if they don't. I think unconsciously, perhaps, I mean, if I was putting my therapist hat back on, because that's my background, I would look at her as a case study, perhaps, of an individual who was trying to self-sabotage, self oh. perhaps, you know, because she's worked in this industry her entire career and yet still chose to move forward sort of fighting against that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I think in the end, she's going to switch industries. Now, you even have advice for, we've talked about, you know, people in the jog market, but even back like in high school or teens, right. you know, what, what do you tell high school teens if, if there's someone that age who, um, you know, maybe have some quirk about them? But, uh, well, I think at that age when, when there's so much development going on and so much judgment about that development coming from within, that it's important to, to nurture the, the positive side of it. So, in other words, if you are a person who's a mile a minute thinker and you're ashamed of it and teachers, you know, try to tell you, you know, why can't you sit still and, and color in the lines and, you know, I, again, I live this with my son, but you know what, that is something that if harnessed can put you in a very, very positive direction. The key is being able to harness it and not label it and not, you know, perhaps medicate it away. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you Vlaho very much. You how to work your quirk. Okay. And I do want to mention your book is the uh, the active creative child. Yes. Thanks everybody for watching. We'll see you next time. Thank you.